Are you looking for an inspiring listen? Something to motivate you? You've come to the right place. Welcome to Women of the Northwest, where we have conversations with ordinary women leading extraordinary lives. Motivating, inspiring, compelling. Julie, welcome to Women of the Northwest. So glad you could join me today. Hi, Jan. I'm so glad to join you. And not only that, but to be a woman of the Northwest, it really is the best place to be for sure. Glad to be here. You're uh, living in Forest Grove, is that right? We are living in Forest Grove, Oregon, but I'm from Washington State, so I was born and raised in Kitsap County, but always a Northwesterner. Um, Hubby comes from PA, from the other side. Yeah. For a little while, we met in the middle in Chicago, and you know what? It just wasn't my thing, (laughs) (laughs) especially with the weather. I was like, I was dying. It was horrible. He, he, He loves shoveling snow, fortunately, but (laughs) <laughs> not me so anyway we came back and he's always loved it here too because it's the only place i know of where the mountains meet the trees and meet the ocean all in one yeah. place which is a love for all of those things for me so i'm where i belong for sure and, and oregon's so um it has such a variety of um, places you can it's a, a few hours drive to go to the desert even if you want to so, or to yep. warmer places than where Astoria is. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, we have a great variety here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Did you have some sunshine today? Finally, I am, I've been so frustrated because I'm a, I'm a gardener and these plants, you know, usually I try, my birthday's the end of April. So normally after my birthday, I try to get things planned. And it was like rain, 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 rain. And I was so <laughs> frustrated and so we got some sun and I got some things in and I will admit I planted a little bit in the rain yeah Um, and then I had Memorial Day off I'm like surely it's going to be sunny so I can plant and it rained so I'm like today it's sunny and tonight I'm going to go out there and plant those flowers (laughs) and I need to get tomatoes still so I'm excited to finally see some sun and my dog as well she's happily got her head stuck out the window right now hoping that you know to run out and chase the squirrel so sun is good we like that in the northwest so, yeah i mean it's so rainy my husband always plants uh, a huge field of corn and has provided corn for the browns meat corn feed every year but it's just like it he can't get it plowed he's got it plowed once and then it doesn't dry out and then he's got to do it again and it's just like i don't know and then he plants a huge huge pumpkin patch for all the grade school kids to come and get pumpkins oh. and so that could go a little later, but the corn, we're really pushing things here. I don't know. Pushing. Yeah. And I even heard it, um, it was a little blib on the news a, a week or so ago when it said there's problems with the red clover, the, the cover crops of red clover, because there was so much, we had so much rain this year. And I'm just like, yep, that's the Northwest. <laughs> that's life. I know you got to love it. And then sometimes you just uh, don't love it quite as much. <laughs> you gotta just take a break and go somewhere else but that's all right <laughs> that's all right too well you uh pop up to canna beach occasionally too oh as often as i can i was actually so actually i was born i don't want to say i was born and raised in canna beach i was not but when i was a teenager uh, when i was a kid we used to take vacation every year to lincoln city which is where my mom grew up having vacations and then when i was a teenager we discovered the canna beach conference center Oh, so right. our annual summer vacation became the Multnomah Week, which at the conference center, and we just love Cannon Beach. And my parents were incredibly smart and bought a very small lot on the north end. And it started with a trailer, and we'd yeah. stay in a trailer. And then finally, they built a little cabin, and we'd stay in the. Ca- it was like a studio, so literally, <laughs> it had living room with a fold down bed, you know, and a little yeah. kitchen room, and we'd stay there. And now it's this monstrous house on the north end of Cannon Beach, and uh, wow. yes, we are there as often as we as we can be, but it's a healing spot for both my husband and I and, and an amazing place. In fact, Cannon Beach plays quite a quite a point in our story, uh, both of our stories of finally landing together. So yeah. it's a special place, yeah. So where'd you meet your husband? Oh, well, see, I met him in Cannon Beach, but it was at Ecola Bible School and it was over 30 years ago. <laughs> and then there was a gap. <laughs> people were like, what? And I'm like, uh-huh. And so I'll try to make a long story short. He, uh, you know, he he went to school there. I went to school there. We were friends. We both went our separate ways. We got married. Um, and he and his family came from Pennsylvania every year to vacation in Cannon Beach. But we had a board and Facebook on common. We weren't really even Facebook friends. Um, but it was the Ecola Bible School, you know, reunion page for our year or whatever it was. And I found out on there that his his wife had had a, had an accident, a bike accident. She had hit her head on the pavement, 
um, hadn't woke up, had been transferred first to Astoria, of course, to Columbia, and then to Portland hospitals. And I just felt this really strong urge inside of me, you know, to message him and let him know I'm here because they're all of their support networks in Pennsylvania. And I'm like, this poor guy, you know? So I said, I'm here, I'm praying. I, I was living in Tigard at the time. So I said, I, I live in Tigard, you know, what can I do? And he said, let's meet for coffee on Saturday. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. You know, so I met him for coffee and we reconnected and um, I, I walked with his family um, for the next seven weeks um, until she passed away. Unfortunately, it was really, it was really sad and really hard. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that was tough, not the result that any of us, you know, wanted, but, you know, we obviously stayed friends and we stayed connected and we visited over the next year flying back and forth. And, Mm -hmm. started dating and kind of one day looked at each other and said you know what maybe this wasn't such an accident after all <laughs> we didn't want, certainly didn't want to lose our loved ones and that was hard on our kiddos you know but we really looked at each other and realized there was more more in the plan than we had ever even thought possible so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we um yeah so we've been back to north beach on Cannon beach several times that's our special spot and in one way it's like coming full circle so, that's awesome yeah yeah isn't it interesting just how our paths lead us you know if you didn't do this you might not have been there you might not have right <laughs> interacted right. here and then the next thing you know it's like 20 years later and something happened. yeah it's exactly kind of, yeah, yeah yeah um yeah so now you're working at arms so arms is abuse recovery ministry services correct tell me about that so it was actually started in the early 90s by um, Stacey Womack, who is an amazing lady, but has never experienced abuse in her life. <laughs> mm. We kind of we kind of laugh at it in a way. Not, I mean, I don't want her to have, have to have, you know, experience an abuse. So I'm glad that she has not. But God really led her to start this organization. And it was for healing from a faith-based perspective. And so we have three components. We have her journey classes, which are free for survivors, or even if you're still in abuse, um, ladies 14 and up. And we could always use leaders for that just to let you know, especially there on the North Coast, we really need a group there in the North Coast area. Um, and it's 15 week series and it's free. Um, and then we also have two intervention programs. And those are virtue and mankind. And those are for people who have been controlling or abusive. Um, and the, also from a faith-based perspective. And those are much longer programs. They're usually about a year and they do cost. Um, you do have to pay for those classes, but we get a lot of referrals from the courts because they're court ordered to take this class. And you know nobody wants to come in and take an abuse class. In fact, mm -hmm. literally they'll come in and they'll go home and they'll tell their survivor, I don't belong there. Gosh, the guy I met today actually threw his wife down the stairs and I would never do that to you. And they think they don't belong there. But the more and more that they understand the concepts of what a controlling relationship is and that they do show some of that controlling behavior, if they can get that mindset switched, you know, with God, it makes all the difference. And so we have those three program components. And then we, uh, we Stacey and I are also out and about quite a bit. So we do a lot of teaching and training, education for pastors and conferences and leaders, um, you know, on the, the true meaning of what submission means as an example, mm -hmm. and headship, mm -hmm. and how God never intends abuse to be available, you know, around. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and those things like that, uh, that, you know, we have been raised from uh, my generation was raised with the pulpit saying, submit, submit, submit. You know, this is your job as a wife. You submit to your husband. He's the headship. This is what you do. You know, oh, are there problems? I still have over 50% of the women in my recovery groups say, that they either went to a counselor or a pastor or a leader, or maybe even the guy at the YMCA, somebody who was a leader in their life who had said, you know, the answer to this is counseling, or maybe he didn't quite mean it that way, or yeah. you, know, you need to do this or that. It, you know, or belittles it, you know, what you're saying, or doesn't quite believe that that exactly. could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that actually creates secondary abuse, you know, for, for the person who has struggled with it. And been molded in their minds that they deserve this when they don't, you know, and that that's where their value value lies. So ARMS works really hard, you know, on that. There are a lot of good programs out there for it. Um, and I know that there's, you know, you have all kinds of listeners and maybe listeners even, you know, don't necessarily, you know, believe in God, but I've 
I've also met a lot of women that did believe in God and then left the church because of their church's response to that abuse, you know, in their life, which is just a really sad phenomenon. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of room in there for education and for our police departments, our, mm -hmm. our first responders. My, my abuser was a cop, a former cop. Mm -hmm. And the first time I called him, they literally came and patted him on the shoulder, said, sorry, brother, you're having a bad day. Left the kids in the, in the house with me and him and left. And I was like, well, wow. you know, I, I was terrified. I thought they're going to walk out of here and he's going to be so mad. And there's going to be some major, major consequences. But because there's been struggles with that, with a lot of the gals I work with because of even first responders, you know, lack of education in the area. Mm -hmm. And now here we have this big trial, right? Johnny Depp right. and Andrew right. <laughs> Amber Heard. Then people are like, there's abuse on both sides and there has been. And she's got multiple personality. And yeah, she probably does, but that's because of her trauma. Yeah. You know, that's because of the abuse that causes those things. And it's really important for our courts and our first responders to be trauma informed. And they're not as much as they need, as they mm -hmm. need to be. And I think that is a new trend for, especially like uh, for educators and teachers to have a lot of trauma informed training. You know, that, right. that is a new trend and it's uh, so, so needed, you know, it's yeah. um, glad that it's finally happening because it should have happened <laughs> years ago. But I, I know, know, right? Yeah, years yeah. and years ago, but thank yeah. goodness that it finally is. Mm -hmm. sure. So what are some things, um, you know, I've talked to people before who haven't realized that they were being abused, that they were verbally abused. What are some, what are some things that abusers do that maybe a person doesn't recognize that that's happening to them? Oh boy, there are a multitude. And, but you know, the majority of abuse is emotional and psychological um, abuse. All forms of abuse though include that, but they're not always obvious. And in, in our research from what we've done, the emotional abuse is harder to heal from than the physical abuse or sexual abuse. And so it's really, really important to address. So there is literally a list of 200 controlling behaviors I could throw at you. Um, and we all do controlling behaviors at times. Mm -hmm. There's things on there like interrupting somebody is control, a controlling behavior, slamming a door, mm -hmm. giving somebody the silent treatment is a controlling behavior. Mm -hmm. And so the first question I get from ladies when I review this with them is, well, maybe I'm an abuser. Mm -hmm. You know, I do some of these things, mm -hmm. but that's not the truth because what the case, the truth is, is abuse is a pattern. So it's a pattern of these behaviors that are used to specifically manipulate and specifically to control. And so I tell them, you know, if, if in your life you're feeling like you need to work on these things, great, that's great, do that. But it does not mean that you're um, an abuser. So there is a multitude of signs and behaviors that somebody can show. There's often a quick, a quick push for involvement for a relationship. There's often extreme jealousy. Um, there's often and no, you, you shouldn't go out with your friends. You should spend this tonight with me instead. Why do you want to go with your friends? You know, you're all, you're my world. You know, why would you not want to spend, you know, the evening with me instead? That doesn't make any sense. Or later when you have children, it might be, you know, like, what? You want to leave for the night and leave the kids with me? You know, that's not going to happen. I, you know, I, I need help. I can't take care of them. All these things that might look like that. Um, isolation is very common. It's very common for them to isolate those from, the ones who would support you the most. So I think it was four months into my first marriage that I heard, we probably shouldn't see your parents so much because, you know, we just fight and bicker after we see your folks. And I was like, he's right. We kind of do fight and bicker after we see my folks. And, and for years, I believe that, but that I, I know that now that's, you know, that's not true. They would have supported us. And, you know, that was a way of isolating me from my support system and my friends and my family and my brothers you know, in addition uh, to that. So, so you, were, you were in an abusive relationship. At what point you know, did you realize that it was an abusive relationship instead of just like, maybe this is all me and... Well, I consider myself one of the lucky ones, believe it or not. <laughs> it was a 17 year marriage and I have also had other abusive relationships. One of the things I've been doing in my healing is really creating a timeline um, and as I've done that, I've seen where it goes back and not just in my life, but in generations before me, and it's helped a little bit with, with my healing and 
but I was very fortunate because I spent 17 years thinking my marriage was normal. Um, and I went and saw a pastor at our church there at North Coast, who's now sadly passed away a month ago. And I was so sad that Pastor Dan um, passed away. But he literally, when I went and saw him in session, my husband refused to come, handed me a sheet. And on it was a list of abusive behaviors. And he said, he words to me, he said, do any of these things happen at home? And I looked at him and I, and I laughed because that was my defense mechanism at the time. I was like, what? Abu what? You know, yeah. so I handed it back to him and he wouldn't take it back. So I looked at it again and I had to admit and I had to nod my head and say, a lot of this stuff does happen several times a week. And I just started crying because, you know, he, he totally validated mm -hmm. that that's not normal. You know, that's not okay. So that was my first introduction to your marriage isn't just unhealthy and it isn't just a little bit toxic. <laughs> your marriage yeah. is abusive, you know, mm -hmm. and it's hard to deal with. You know, nobody wants to sit there and say, I've been abused or I even, you know, even the words victim and survivor have a mentality with them that we don't want, right. you know, to say. So right. I, I, I just shake my head. You know, I know it was my time and God brought that to me, but it makes me sad because still probably 60% of the gals that I work with in group have had the opposite experience mm -hmm. where they've heard you know things like you should submit more you should pray more you should fast mm -hmm. more you should you should come you in should. for couples counseling which we never recommend in, in abuse you should. You know? uh you should exactly exactly yeah. me 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 and not him 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 and that yeah. is so opposite of uh, you know that's the victim blaming you know that we that we hear about the fact of the matter is is you can't control him or if you're in the opposite and you're a man being abused you can't control her you can only control your own attitudes and your own actions and move your own muscles you can't do it for somebody else yeah if you could um i don't know this is probably a question that um maybe can't be answered i don't know but if you could just give one or two best advices to start out on trying to understand what's going on or how to get out of it, what would you do? I would have to definitely send you to arms. Um, and it's just thing. abuse, abuse recovery.org. And there's a tab on there called resources. And under those are going to be numerous articles, like the warning signs of abuse uh, and a list of abusive checklists, mm -hmm. how to respond to a survivor, how churches respond to abuse. There's a re, a re recommended reading list that we recommend that has many, many books mm -hmm. um, and just start soaking up the knowledge. Um, it is, it is out there. Um, and I've had, I had a girl in group last week who told me, she goes, I started her, her, her journey class. She said, because I wanted to really find out if my um, relationship was abusive or whether it's just toxic. And I said, well, what have you decided? She's been coming a few weeks. And she mm -hmm. said, I decided it's just toxic. I said, I just wanted to go give her a hug because I'm like, honey, if your relationship is toxic, then there is abuse in your relationship. Your relationship should never, ever be toxic. But for now, I allow her her definition, right? Mm -hmm. As she sees it and working right. with her is what she got. And I pray that one day she recognizes that, you know, those, that toxicity that she sees in her relationship is in fact abuse or it wouldn't mm -hmm. be there, you know, in mm -hmm. the first place. So there is a lot of educational resources out there. I've even had come and take her journey groups that maybe didn't realize they were interviews i had one a couple weeks ago say i came because i grew up in it and she goes i'm taking these classes and now i'm realizing that i married into it too and i had no idea you know and it was more of an emotional uh, psychological abuse and less mm -hmm. obvious abuse which is you know what we right all you know the, yeah which when it's obvious it's obvious but when it's not you know it's not um and so the classes can be really helpful even just on an educational basis or if you know somebody that's an abuse or if you think you know somebody that's abuse if you know somebody in your family that maybe has shown some signs you know or maybe every time you want to go out with them their significant other is like no i don't think so you're not going anywhere you know or they're constantly texting while they're out and about when you're right. they're having a good time with them. You know, those are signs of a potential unhealthy, and I would say more than toxic, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. relationship. So, mm -hmm. and then just pay attention. I, I can't tell you how many times I hear from people that they were just like, I had a bad feeling or, you know, yeah. and 
Christianese, if we're believers, we would call that a red flag from the Holy Spirit. But even right. if you don't believe in God, you have another source. There's still something in your head that's like, you know, mm. something's not right. And, right. And, and I've got to research it. So education is really key for that. So you're an author. Tell me about um, what you've written. You've written a couple of books and published lately. Tell us about those. Sure, I'd love to. This is so really, it was my next step in my healing, and I didn't realize that. But you know, part of what we do when we go in abuse is we lose our gifts and talents. We don't lose them as far as our abilities. We lose them as far as our ability to, to pursue them and to pursue them with passion. Um, and so, you know, I was always a writer from very, very young. And when I was able to get through my my healing process, God said, right. I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> and, and it's not like I ever stopped. I mean, I did like write blog posts and I wrote for businesses that I worked for and things, but I hadn't really put anything out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so I'm like, yeah, I have to, it's a part of, it's a part of me. I can't not, I can't not write. It's like not breathing to me. It's just, mm-hmm. I've got to do it. And that's starters. Secondly, if I'm going to do this, I want it to impact right? I wanted to make a difference for people and to not just be a book that gets thrown into the world and then, you know, nobody's impacted by it. So at the same time, I became very interested in human trafficking because I was one of those people, sadly, that thought that human trafficking only happened in third world countries. And boy, how wrong was I? So I went out there, I went out on the streets and I researched it and I realized that, you know, nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a prostitute when I grow up. And nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a a stripper, a stripper in a club. No, you've got a pimp or you've got a partner or a husband or somebody saying, you know, honey, you got the body and we need to pay the bills and you need to go do this and to make it happen. And that's human trafficking. That's Mm -hmm. trafficking in all sense of the word. And so in my mind, um, I had two characters kind of who had their own journeys. And so Innocent Lives is the first book out and we're getting ready to change cover so it's not going to look like this forever but it's about Sienna and Jasmine and in their case they are um, kidnapped and trafficked and go two different directions but in most cases trafficking is not does not happen by kidnapping that we know of in my mind I still say what about all these strange children every, every year that are kidnapped and I have to wonder about that that um, mostly it happens to your intimate partner relationships is what we call it uh, but in this case, the two girls go on very two different journeys. And I wanted to show the two different sides of trafficking. Because mm-hmm. one of these gals really grows to like her trafficker because mm-hmm. he is saving her from the big evil bad monster trafficker. And until she discovers a secret in his house and realizes that he's a monster too, she actually right. sees him as more as her salvation versus yeah. this other gal that lands more in a brothel situation. And for her, her owners provide drugs, you know, and that's her escape out of her reality is to to use drugs. And she actually also develops the multiple personality, which they call disassociated disorder. Yeah. Disorder these days. So it's DID. That's very common. Right. And and very, thank you. Very common in, in trauma, traumatic situations. So, so there'll be a book two and three coming up in that series. And then I'm also working on writing um, a real intense healing devotional because the programs that we have are great, but I found that they're just, they're not always enough. And yeah. some people need deeper and some people need to dig. And some, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we have ladies that have been in her journey for years and years and it's been wonderful and they love it, but it's time to take a step forward and to really dig in. Yeah. Um, and then some people, of course, not ever heal to the point that they need to and um so i'm hopeful that this devotional it's 52 weeks but it addresses all these questions that we survivors have like mm-hmm. you know i did this what if i did this or now he's lying about me and everybody in the family believes him right, oh, right. you know what do i do and i each situation i talk about you know scripture that mm-hmm. addresses that there's a couple journaling questions a little bit of an art activity um and I need to work on finishing that up as well because I think it will be an important aspect for for people in their healing healing journey. So yeah, yeah, that's great. I'll put some uh, links in the show notes for all of that information for people too. We just got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask you, what brings you the greatest joy? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there's so many things. Well, God 
and of course, but my children, uh, my husband, I have an amazing second husband. I'm so grateful for him, of course, and, um, and my grandchild. So she just turned one a couple days ago. I'm a Nana. I know. I feel, I'm like, surely I'm too old to be a grandma. So you can't call me grandma. You know, we have to come up with something else, but she brings joy as well. And, and, you know, helping people out of the pit, you know, when you hear people that are like, you know, your story, like I gave my full story at Calvary McMinnville a weekend mm -hmm. and a half, two weeks ago or so, an hour and a half, way, way too long. And I still cut off a lot of it. Um, but having people say, I heard your story. I'm in your story. I've been in your yeah. story what do I do now you know and 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 how do I get to where God can use me to and get past that feeling that's all extremely rewarding mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah, Most important aspect. yeah. making a difference for the kingdom yeah yeah so okay well Julie thank you so much for being on here with me and I think this um you know, you might have helped some people today. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. And you know what? If you're hearing it and Pat and you need to pass it on to someone else, please do it because that's that's how the word gets around. If you think somebody in your life might be in abuse or even, you know, a controlling relationship, you know, help them, listen, believe them, pass resources on as you can. Don't rescue them. Do not run and rescue them. Um, but you need to enable them to make their own good choices and, and provide them with good information. Right. And I think uh, that comes with the more that we know, the more we're able to help others too, or at least lead them to the right places. Right. Hindsight is twenty twenty. right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> if I had known all this when I was 15, I know. Right. <laughs> right. right. Well, the Zoom yeah. has given me the less oh, than a minute. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Julie. <laughs>